Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, this study I'm about to, uh, to, to show you really is based on some sampling that was done in the 1990s of uh, Buffalo in Zimbabwe. Um, I'm not going to go through this. Everyone, everyone knows the, uh, the structure of foot and mouth, but just to say that uh, we have sequenced the whole genome of all these viruses, but originally we did VP1 by uh, direct sequencing, and we will look at some of that data as well. Um, so FMD causes acute vesicular disease, obviously, in domestic uh, cloven-hoofed animals. But in the African buffalo, clinical disease we think is rare and rarely observed, and uh, following infection, the virus is persistently carried in the uh, esophageal pharyngeal area of the upper respiratory tract. And so during the 1990s, um, probank samples were collected from free-living African buffalo in multiple herds in well, approximately six different geographic areas in Zimbabwe. And viruses were isolated on bovine thyroid cells and typed by ELISA. And we found 158 virus isolates uh, belonging to uh, either SAT1, SAT2 or SAT3. Um, and mainly uh, SAT1 majority and a lesser number of SAT2 and SAT3 viruses. Um, now, this these show the study areas, uh, which are mainly the um, national parks and game reserves, safari areas, etc., in the, what we call the west here, and the northwest and the southeast. Most of the central country are free of buffalo, and at the time, these parks, the main parks, were, were pretty well fenced off to stop buffalo wandering out and, and coming into contact with cattle. So if we look at the isolates we actually got, uh, this is three maps showing SAT1, SAT2, and SAT3. Each circle represents a herd, and the number in that circle shows the number of viruses we isolated. Uh, so, oh, sorry, we, so you can see that... Uh, we have a good selection uh, around the whole country. And if we look at, uh, these are the numbers down here, you may not be able to read them very well, but this shows the uh, age range. So for less than one year, um, we got a 47% rate of isolation. One to three years, 69%. And over three years, 29%. So we actually, uh, overall, a 41% rate of of um, isolation. Um, so we had, we had good, good recovery rates of viruses. So initially we sequenced the VP1s by conventional Sanger sequencing. And then uh, when we'd finished this, uh, suddenly some money appeared. Uh, and we were able to uh, sequence the whole genomes of all the viruses. We actually are still doing some of them. Um, and these were done with an Illumina MySeq platform which we've published the method, and that's doing it without, PC, without PCRing it initially, anyway. Uh, and the genome assembly um, was a, the following. Tr uh, adapters were trimmed and, and merged overlapping um, read pairs. Uh, the, the viral genomes were assembled in parallel, including host contamination, and using a novel in-house pipeline with two main components. The first one enabled detecting of assembly, an assembly of sequences irrespective of whether a viral or host, even when coverage was low. And the second stage used scaffolds of vir known viruses to, um, to guide the assembly of those contigs and not include any of the reference sequence into the final assembly. And then we did phylogenetic analysis with maximum likelihood using Mega-7 or time-resolved Bayesian methods using BEAST. Um, so, so far we've sequenced 143 uh, viruses. Um, in some cases, multiple serotypes were identified in samples which had, which had not been evident at the time of serological testing. Uh, for phylogenetic analysis, the polyprotein coding region was split into four parts the leader, P1, P2, and P3. And the P1 region, um, sequences clustered together by serotype and then by buffalo herd stroke geographic location. Whereas in L, um, P2, P3, 
um, sequences clustered by buffalo herd or geographic region, irrespective of serotype. We took this to mean that extensive recombination had been taking place um, between these viruses. So if we look, if we look at the, what the VP1 data initially told us, and in terms of topotyping, we see um, for each serotype, SAT1, SAT2, SAT3, we see um, a different topotype in each geographic region. There are actually some here where you, you, you see that uh, one topotype is in the wrong region. This was because at, at one stage buffalo were moved uh, between regions. But when, uh, when we showed them that uh, this could um, interfere with tracing the origins later on, as far as I'm aware, buffalo were moved back to where they originally came from. You see that there are differences in the patterns of some of them. SAT1, um, this type, of type 1, comes all the way down to here, whereas in SAT3, the topo type 2 stretches up into the northwest. And so there are, we don't really understand why there should be differences uh, in, the, in, in the way that uh, the, the uh, serotypes are distributed in the buffalo herds. Um, we will just show you this is a Bayesian tree, Animax and Likelihood tree of the complete capsid row region except for, three, uh, for VP4. The VP4 actually doesn't show serotype specificity and that's we think also where the recombination points quite often are. Um, and you can see here they quite clearly separate into SAT 1, 2 and 3. And then if you look at, uh, as we saw for VP1, the different colours here represent the, diff the three different regions around Zimbabwe. And the same thing happens with the maximum likelihood tree. Well, you won't be able to see that very, very easily. When we looked at, uh, we looked at 3D polymerase separately and what you find is there's, there's no separation by serotype at all. They're all mixed in together. There's some indication that the viruses in the southeast uh, fall amongst the, the northwest ones, but I, I think I, I doubt it. The, if you look at the, the tree here with the error, the time error rates on them, then they're rather large, and these, these trees need rerunning. We don't see it in the maximum likelihood tree, so I think this is more work's needed here to... Uh, to get this uh, correct. Now, we want one practical use of this is if we map, if we compare um, cattle outbreaks against these uh, backbone of, of buffalo isolates, and you see here, I'm not sure if you can see it, in the, all the ones that have yellow are cattle isolates, while all the rest are buffalo. And what we see is a number of distinct um, viruses, and if I hopefully do this, we can we can say that we think there are at least seven introductions into cattle between 1981 and 2017, which are distinct from each other, and we, which we think have been introduced from the buffalo population. And we can even tell whereabouts they've come from. So three from from Western. Zimbabwe, uh, three from the southeast and one from um, west, northwest kind of, but never, never from the north. That's because these regions are tsetse fly regions. There aren't very many cattle up here, if any. Um, and in the middle, as I said, there are no buffalo in the middle. Uh, but out, but if there are outbreaks, they tend to be around uh, the southeast or, or in the west. The, the cattle outbreaks. If we look at SAT3, it's uh, perhaps even more clear because there are very few SAT3 outbreaks uh, in southern Africa. And in Zimbabwe, there were no outbreaks of SAT3 between 1955 and 1973. But between 1974 and 1991, there were eight outbreaks. Well, eight, well we think there are eight introductions. And uh, if I do that... They are, those are the what I think are the eight introductions, um, and again, they come from either the west 
or mostly the southeast. Uh, so this is a good tool for tracing the origin of potential cattle outbreaks. And in fact, SAT3 viruses really most of the time only exist in Buffalo. They're, they're not maintained in the cattle population to any significant degree anywhere in Southern Africa. Okay. If we look at SAT2, the situation is somewhat different. We have lots more outbreaks of, of SAT2 uh, and we don't have so many buffalo samples. And it is very difficult to know whether when virus, if, if viruses are introduced from buffalo, w whether they're persisting in the cattle population. And we suspect that they are, but, we, it, but it's difficult to tell in some cases how long that is. For example, here we have 2010, 2015 to 2017. Is this maintenance? We don't know. And uh, the same down, down in here. We, in, in this, actually, here we only have um, a, a few buffalo isolates and uh, lots of cattle outbreaks. You could guess of where they've come from, and that would say maybe 11, but th that's certainly uh, not conclusive. And those, again, are the th same three areas that potentially uh, where the viruses originate from. Um, so our conclusions are that phylogenetic analysis of different genome regions demonstrated viral clustering by buffalo herd, and the lack of clustering by serotype in non captured regions suggests extensive recombination has taken place between the serotypes. The close relationship between some within herd viruses, which I haven't showed you, but suggests the possibility of acute infection epidemics uh, where many animals are um, infected at the same time whether they are young animals or even older ones, but we have yet to look at that and analyze that data properly. A comparison of VP1 sequences, those are cattle outbreak isolates, reveals a defined number of introductions of SAT1 and SAT3, but a more complex situation with SAT2, with possible longer term persistence in the cattle population. And we'd like to study this more. Um, we hopefully are going to do some of that in Botswana, but we'd also like to continue this in Zimbabwe. Uh, and this is just the acknowledgements. The original Buffalo study was funded by the ODA uh, and uh, the genome sequencing by uh, a BBSRC grant and the VP1 sequencing by a DEFRA grant. Thank you.